We're going to have a three-part session this evening, just so you know what to expect. I'm going to start us out with a general consideration of the uh, night prayers. Then Deacon Yarvan is going to take us deeply into the first of the Psalms for that service. And then I will come back and look at the last of the Psalms for that service. So perhaps we don't normally think of a prayer service that took place at midnight as being an opportunity to receive and to give the gifts of darkness, whatever those may actually be. But we are all aware, I think, in our practical experience that there's something special about the middle of the night. Some people have to get up at midnight in order to go to work. I'm sure some of you have had that experience, as have I in the past. Or we have to get up to go to the airport at the time when everything else is closed in the airport and it's like walking down a long, dark corridor until we get to a little huddle of people waiting at our gate. Sometimes we may have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the hospital. At other times, it may be as simple as the fact that we sometimes do have to get up in the middle of the night to go down the hall for a glass of water. And while many of us are morning people, there are others of us who prefer the night. Those people stay up in part to enjoy the feeling of being wrapped in a world without color and with much less noise and activity. There's an inspiration in the darkness. Sometimes there's an anticipation that comes with being up in the dark, being awake in the middle of the night. As a kid, did you ever sneak downstairs in the evening, the night before Christmas morning? Sometimes the darkness can leave us feeling vulnerable. After all, we have light dependent eyes. And so the darkness can feel a little disorienting. The normal daytime colors and shapes are different at night. The darkness can even be a little bit frightening. We might, for example, feel just fine going into this attic in the daytime. but maybe not so much at night. So in whatever way we and our active imagination and our schedules may experience the darkness, may experience the middle of the night, there is a kind of a feeling, often at least, that magical things can happen in the kingdom where the moon reigns rather than the sun. There's something potentially magical about the way that things change in the darkness. Of course, they don't change. It's our perception of them that changes, but nonetheless. The stars were given their names by ancient 
humans. Lying on their backs in the darkness night after night. Looking up into the black sky and discerning patterns in the way that the stars are placed relative to one another in the movements of the moon and of the planets that were visible to the naked eye. And of course, these do not stay the same. Once you have identified Cygnus the swan and you can find it, it begins to move across the sky and then it will be replaced by others afterwards in kind of an everlasting parade of change that causes us to anticipate the return of these specific patterns as indicators of what is coming to us next in terms of the seasons. The monks at St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai rise at midnight to this, making their way to church for their version of Kishirai in Jam the night service in almost blinding starlight. And their guests, who may not rise for the service, will find it hard to sleep because the stars that shine through the guest house window seem so near and cast so much, unbelievably much, light. The darkness is not entirely dark. And in fact, this is one of the great gifts of real nighttime in the natural world. It's the darkness that creates a backdrop against which we can see so many things that are not normally visible to us. Darkness alters our vision, and no two midnights are the same. The stars of summer are not the stars of winter. The moon waxes and wanes. And clouds change the contours of the night sky. So that when one rises in the middle of the night to pray, it may seem like a very different night from the one previous. And there are days when at midnight we see nothing at all. We've had a lot of these at the seminary lately. <laughs> but our senses are overcome by the sound of rain falling in the darkness. And we appreciate the variations in the sound as it falls on grass or pavement or the roof. So rising at midnight to pray the night hour, then, is a gift for the people who exercise the privilege of participating in it. And at midnight, the praying monk had already been through two cycles of sleep since his last prayer before going to bed around nine. And this was really important. Monks were not looking to sabotage their next day's work. Although 
there were some monks and congregations of monks that did experiment with sleep deprivation in order to better understand what it might mean to be on an angelic schedule. Biology tells us that darkness is essential for our physical and mental health, for our physical and mental restoration and rejuvenation. During a 90 minute sleep cycle, somehow the body releases toxins, the brain sorts all of our short term memories from the day and converts them to long term well maybe some of them some of us not so much. And then it packs up and stores away all of the new information that came to it during the day. Tossing some. Adding other pieces of information to already established patterns and so on cleaning up. Our breath and our heart rate both slow down. And our muscles relax into a state of relative paralysis. And I suppose if you wanted to, you could insert here any or all of the healings that Jesus did for paralytics and it might make a very interesting homily or meditation. In the darkness, nerve cells reorganize themselves. Stores of hormones are replenished. Proteins are processed. Muscle repair and tissue growth both take place. No thanks to our conscious input. Chemicals that were released by emotional reactions during the day are swept up tamped down in that funny little part of our brain called the amygdala. Hunger hormones and digestive enzymes are powered down, and unless you happen to be one of those people who eats right before bed. <laughs> Cells are repaired so that in the morning they will be ready to take in and process glucose and other helpful substances and do it efficiently. So you can see why some fathers reasoned that if darkness and sleep are an image of death, an image that we revisit on a daily basis, then maybe, if we look at it the other way around, then maybe the state of death is really a time for house cleaning, sorting and putting away experiences, thoughts, and information from the daytime of life, powering down the emotions and the hormones and the processes that have occupied our waking hours in this world, and preparing ourselves for a new day a day whose dawning, not coincidentally, the monk would see at the end of the service. So, in other words, in the same way that it had been at the first creation, when we're told darkness blanketed the abysses, the deeps, so also our life, our daytime reality begins in the dark. And because of that first creation and our own lifetime of experience, we no longer wonder whether there might be a light tomorrow that marks the beginning of the emergence of order from chaos as it did in Genesis. We in our darkness pray, having no doubt at all that the sun will rise, 
and its illumination of our world will begin long before we actually see its orb on the horizon. So, if Vespers, which we spoke about last week, is the prayer service that marks the transition from one day to the next, then the night hour is the first service in that new day. And so, the night service is the first one that you will find in the Jamakirk, the first one that you will find in the Book of Hours. It wasn't originally a service for every day. Rather, it was reserved for the night preceding Sunday morning. It was a vigil service where the intention was that we, unlike the disciples who went to sleep as soon as Jesus left them to go pray alone in Gethsemane, unlike his sleeping disciples, the monks, we would be wakeful and actively present. And you can see why this service would not necessarily be for everyone. Given the householder schedule, it's not a service that's layman friendly. Hence, you would put it on a Saturday night when people don't have to work the next morning. You would have your vigil service, your morning service, badarak, following on right after. And there were several other night services. We still have them, the huskums, vigil services that marked other moments in the year that commemorated darkness experiences in the life of Jesus. So there's that's one aspect of what the Kisherayin Jam was for. But later the service became more frequent. It even became a daily service. As the significance of time for liturgy overall became more and more clear to the monks, to the fathers, it became clear to them that everything that pertains to Jesus's life also reflected important truths in the life of Adam and of other Old Testament figures, particularly of David, whose Psalms were considered to be both reflective of the creation and the first people and forward looking to Christ and beyond. And they also reflected times in our own life as the church and as individuals and as smaller groups. And as the monks and the fathers became more and more aware that in fact, every present moment, if we stop to think about it, looks both backwards at the past that led up to it, and it looks forward to the future that will come about because of it, as well as, of course, being the present moment, existing in and of and as just itself. So the present is the present, but the present also contains what has come before it and is the seed of what comes after it. And that kind of cyclic changing view of time was very inspirational to the people who prayed this service. So the Kishirayin Jam doesn't just have us watching in the garden with Jesus. It also has us watching with Adam as he awaited Christ's arrival in hell after the crucifixion. 
It also invites us to watch with David. As he hid in a dark cave, awaiting deliverance from Saul, or in metaphorical darkness, as we'll see a little later this evening, seeking God's deliverance from his own treacherous son, Absalom. We pray with all of them and many more. We also pray in the darkness with future beings. We pray for, in our own future, for our own future being, as our own future being, because at some point in time, we will wait in the darkness of the tomb to be called into the light of the resurrected life. So it's a lot, a lot goes on in this midnight service as it does in others. There are layers, there are different aspects that we can think about or identify with as we pray. And so praying at midnight is not just a privilege, it's also an opportunity to pray on behalf of so many others as well as ourselves. So we're going to think about it from the point of view of several very significant church fathers. First of all, Krikor Naregatsi's father, Bishop Khosrov of Anzevatsik, a province that lay at the eastern end of Lake Van, a man who saw many sunrises like this one. I hope this is a sunrise picture, at least. <laughs> I try to orient myself on the lake. Khosrov very well knew the joy and the privilege of rising with the midnight stars and praying until the sun rose. And in his commentary on the hours, his Megnutun Jamagat Kutyants, He did his best to convey to his clergy and his seminarians that same joy, that same understanding that darkness is a gift. And in its own way, it is a gift of light. And we're fortunate that Khosrov was not writing his commentary for his learned peers. He was writing it for his clergy and his seminarians who were not, who had not devoted their lives entirely to learning. And so it behooved him to write expansively for them, not to just deliver to them a series of points in the confidence that they would be able to develop them on their own, no. And since we are not in a position to do that most of the time either, reading his commentary is quite refreshing. In his introduction to the night prayers, Khosrov told his audience to pay very careful attention to the first words of the service. Lord, if you open my lips, my mouth will sing your blessings. <laughs> he says it's a statement that's very appropriate for people who realize that waking up, whether from sleep or from death, is not a given. It's not something that we can accomplish 100% on our own. It requires some divine enactment. And it brings a realization with it as well. He says, from the very first phrase, 
This service shows us the care of God. Who even now, before we get to the world to come, has gifted us with rest from our labors and our cares and our sins and from the various things that tire us here by means of sleep at night. So even though those things were mandated for us appropriately to our transgression, in other words, our labors and our cares and all of that, they're a consequence of that first transgression. Nonetheless, the compassion of God's love for humanity could not endure for us to remain perpetually in such circumstances, but partitioned our life and gave us one portion of life as rest. Not as something we merited, but as a gift. And so he's thinking next of the prayer that follows the Psalms in this service. All of us who have arisen from the restfulness of sleep which the God who loves humanity gifted to us as a comfort and a relief for our weakness. And he goes on to say that in a way, <laughs> sleep is a gift, but it's an odd gift. It's a gift we can't refuse. <laughs> He said, sleep is a free necessity. That's a contradiction in terms. <laughs> sleep was created out of God's love for humankind. This is why it says, which God who loves humanity has gifted to us. But it says, God loved us so much that he did not make sleep a voluntary activity because some of us would never do it. Some of us would just spend our entire lifetime spinning around, working, <laughs> or whatever. And so God did not make sleep voluntary, but instead he made it obligatory. And how did he make it an obligation for us to sleep? Very simply, by weighing down our eyes and our body and darkening the senses of our soul. And anyone who has had a class in that terrible time slot right after lunch has experienced <laughs> this involuntary weighing down of the eyes and the body and the darkening of the senses of our soul. This is why the night service calls us to awaken from the night of sleep because by that weight, our body is comforted and relieved and restored from its labor. And then he goes on to say that in a way, rising at midnight in order to pray to God is the way that we acknowledge our appreciation for the gift of sleep. as well as a way of making sure that we get to enjoy that night sky that we would not otherwise get up to see. And so Khosrov says, we offer a portion of that gift of sleep back to the one who gave it. So how does that offering of a portion of our sleep back to the one who gave it. How does that look in terms of a service? Well, the night hour is a very complicated structure. It has variables for different days of the week as well as for different feasts. It has an extensive, ever-changing set of psalm readings. The variables fill 200 pages in the Jamakirk that was printed by St. Vartan Press in 1986, the one that I use most often. 
But boiling it down really, really, really far, <laughs> this is what my layman's brain sees as the basic structure of the service. First, you have four psalms that are always the same. Psalm 3, Psalm 87, Psalm 102, Psalm 142. Then there's a prayer on behalf of those who have, as, of us who have risen. Then nowadays we have Nersa Shnorali hymns, very beautiful hymns, appropriate to the time of night, picking up on different phrases from the Psalms. After the hymns, there's a full canon of Psalms for the day. Monastic discipline read a canon of Psalms every day. So whatever the canon of Psalms happens to be for the day gets read. Then there are more Psalms for the gospel of the day, whichever that happens to be. Then you get the gospel reading, and then you get a hymn that depends on the day. So somebody getting ready to do night service has a lot of pre-prep to do when the service is being done in full, which it very seldom is nowadays. Obviously, it's a four or five hour service. I just couldn't resist sharing with you little snippets from a couple of those hymns that close out the service. And I really like this. By him are we bound and released and inseparably bound again. First, at our creation, we are bound soul and body. Then at death, we are released when the soul separates from the body. And in the end, we will be bound together again, inseparably, soul and body, on the day that will have no evening. These words make it clear that there is a definite eschatological aspect to the night prayers. We have come from a state where body and soul have been all but separated in sleep, and we're looking forward to a time, or we're looking forward beyond time, when there will no longer be weakness in soul and body such that they cannot stay together permanently. We look forward to the time when they will be inseparably one forever, when our two natures, as it were, will truly be one and there will be no need for night, no need for the strengthening sleep that night brings. So with that introduction, this evening we're going to focus on what the Armenian commentators have said about those first four Psalms only. And in fact, I believe we're only going to get to the first and the last of the four. These are called fixed psalms because no matter what night service you go to, what day, these are going to be part of the service. And it's pretty easy to see why these psalms were chosen. All of them but one mention night or waking. The only one that's not there is Psalm 102, which is kind of a response to Psalm 87's question, why Lord? <laughs> so Psalm 3, verse 5, I dozed and I went to sleep. That might remind you of a parable. I awoke and it is the Lord who receives me. Now you could translate all of these in slightly different ways. If you are familiar with a different one, feel free to say it in your mind. Psalm 87, Lord God of my salvation, I called out in your presence by day and by night. Also from Psalm 87, you can see where the life of Christ might be used as an interpretive tool with this. They laid me in an inner pit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And again, Psalm 87, which is the, the thickest with the references to sleep, waking, and the dark. 
Will your wonders be recognized in the dark? And then from Psalm 142, a verse that we will return to in the third part of the evening, the enemy has pursued my soul. He bent my life down to the ground and sat me in darkness like one dead to the ages. Each of the commentators draws his students' attention to something different in this psalm sequence. You remember the commentaries were written for the already learned to make them yet more learned, <laughs> to give them deeper, wider perspective, to, to prompt them to have insights out of which they could teach and preach in ways that would connect with their people. And all of the commentators are aware that there are multiple layers of interpretation that are possible. There are multiple people being addressed. There are multiple situations. So I'd like to take a brief five minute break and then we'll come back to join Deacon Yervant as he leads us deeper into Psalm 3, the first Psalm in the night service sequence. So we'll see you back here at 10 minutes before eight. Welcome back, everybody. So in this section of our evening, we're going to look at Psalm number three. And to get us started, I am hoping to play for you a recording of just how this psalm is heard. So just a reminder, we started with um, sorry. Lord, if you open us my lips. Those are the first words we hear in the night service. And then immediately after the priest's blessing, we hear this song. Okay, so hopefully this is going to work. Please give me uh, an indication if it does not. Der zi pazum yeren erich kim ye pazum karyani veraim pazum kasein zant neime techik pergutyun sora aras vazyur. Al tu derok naganim yes parkim yev parts ratsu tich kelho imo tsaini vimo yes arder gartazi yev lavavin si lerne serpo yurme yes nanchetsi yevi kun yere zartia yev deren tuneli ime voch yer gait yes i pura vor zorat noza vuik shurchana gi badial basharial bahe inzis. Ari der ye pergiazis aswazim, zitu harer zamenesian, buik ein entis tishnamut yam, i darabaduts ye zadamunus meravorats pashresces, diar te pergutun i vera jovertianko or nutunko. Zohor mutyabkov sadagyaz tishnamisim, yevgoro zamen aine rich zansinimo, ziyes tsarakoyem. Thank you. 
And one moment as I try to share my other screen with you. All right. So what you just heard is the psalm that is chanted right after the priest's initial blessing, after we hear those first couple verses, um, Lord, if you open us to our lips. And what we heard, it was all of Psalm 3, and then uh, I believe it's the ending of, um, it's a later psalm, I believe it's Psalm 142. And if you were in a monastery, you would hear between Psalm 3 and 142, you would hear a collection of two to three other psalms. So it would be a very lengthy part of the service. Um, and 85 would be the one that comes right after Psalm number three. Uh, sorry, 87 is the one that comes right after Psalm number three. So we're going to look in depth at Psalm three tonight. And as I was preparing this, I thought, how interesting that the first things we hear are, Lord, if you open us my lips, I will sing your praises. And then we go immediately to this psalm, which is anything but a happy psalm, at least to begin. This is the heading that we have in Scripture. A psalm of David at the time when he fled from, fled from the presence of his son Absalom. Now, for our learned monks and Tabirs who would be chanting, this would be enough of a indicator as to the context of this psalm. But for most of us, this is probably at best a little fuzzy. Um, so we're gonna go we're gonna look a little bit at the story of Absalom so that we can understand the context in which this psalm is at least understood to have been written and composed. Absalom was one of King David's sons, and his story reads like a modern-day soap opera. He was known for his good looks, in particular his long hair, and he's best remembered for having avenged his sister Tamar and conspiring against his own father for the throne. So who was he? He first appears in the book of 2 Samuel, and he's introduced as the third and perhaps the favorite of David's sons born at Hebron. And then he appears again throughout chapters 13 to 15 as the, the saga of his story unfolds. He's included in the complete list of David's children found in 1 Chronicles 3. And the Bible mentions that Absalom's mother was the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, significant because he later flees there after the murder of his brother. His name, ironically, means the father of peace. Absalom, Shalom, Absalom, Avi Shalom. Despite the world he was born into, his father named him peaceful. And perhaps this was, um, as was often a naming convention, the, the possibility of trying to will into the world what you're hoping for. But his life was marked with discord, collusion, murder, separation from his family. And though he was born with good looks, peace seemed to elude him. So he had a beautiful sister. Good looks ran in the family. Her name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. So we know that Tamar was, um, she was violated by her, half, by her brother. And Absalom rebelled out of revenge for his sister. So in chapter 13, uh, Amnon of, sorry, chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, um, Amnon was tormented because of what he had done to her. Um, and so he faked illness to lure her to his bedside, um, after which he took advantage of her. And then he was filled with hatred, which is not uncommon for um, those who hurt others. They often experience that kind of hatred after the fact to justify or to deal with the wrong they have done. King David, of course, was furious when he learned what had happened. And Tamar went to live with her brother Absalom, who hated Amnon because of what he did. 
Two years later, Absalom schemed to murder Amnon for violating his sister, and he was successful. And David mourned his absent son, now branded with the guilt of fratricide. The author of 2 Samuel says, David mourned a long time for his son Amnon, but when he got over Amnon's death, he was filled with longing for his son Absalom. Uh, and I think it's interesting, uh, in spite of the many times where maybe David was not seen to have shown mercy, he certainly had mercy and paternal love for his children, no matter what they did. Does that remind us of anybody? So David eventually allowed Absalom to come back to Jerusalem, but for two years he was forbidden to be in the presence of his father. Eventually, Absalom got what he wanted. He came and he bowed down uh, before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. For the next four years, he conspired against King David, however, um, and this culminated in a battle that resulted in uh, Absalom's death. So Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth while the mule that was, was under him went on. And if any of you grew up with um, children's Bibles like I did, you may have had an illustration similar to this one in it, which um, has always loomed very large in my imagination and my mythology here. When Joab learned of Absalom's state, he took three javelins in his hand and he thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive on the oak. When David heard of Absalom's death, despite his son's attempt to conspire against him, he mourned over the loss of his son. The king was deeply moved. This is 2 Samuel 18 now. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. Would I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son. So in spite of um, Absalom's conspiring to take over and be crowned king, um, here we have David exercising mercy um, that only a parent can, can offer, I should think. So it was during one, it was when, David was escaping from Absalom, trying to conspire and take over the kingdom that this psalm we are to understand was written. Now, I, I showed you the heading that comes from scripture. And now I'd like to show you another heading. So this heading comes from our friend Vartan Arevelsi. A psalm when he fled from Absalom. It prophesies the straits of David and suffering of the people in captivity. Okay, so, so far, uh, at least the, the part about David is we understand that to be implicit from um, the original heading in scripture. The suffering of the people in captivity, this, of course, refers to the Babylonian captivity that the, uh, the Jewish people would endure many centuries after David. And it's, uh, we had, I think we've mentioned in earlier sessions, the captivity gets referred to in at least uh, a few places in the Psalms. And we're to understand that uh, if David is the author of those Psalms, it's that he saw that future captivity through the eye of the Holy Spirit that gave him that understanding. Um, so this much fits with the original heading. And here it gets more interesting. So Vartan supplies this. And it also prophesies the passion and the death of the Lord and his resurrection. This psalm is said at night also about our nature squeezed by devils. For it was, that is our nature, was saved and delivered by the mystery of death and through the resurrection of the Lord. So while this psalm starts out um, very harshly in terms of its subject matter, to, to go from saying, I'm going to praise you the moment my lips open, and then we're talking immediately about those who squeeze us, it's a, it's a quick um, turn, and then 
Vartan supplies us very succinctly here why this, um, this psalm is actually very hopeful. So we're going to look at the psalm now. So on the left here, I have the I've provided you with the Kurapar. This is what you heard sung by Bishop Daniel in the recording. Uh, this is exactly how it appears um, in the Jamakirk that we use every morning. And I've supplied you here with the translate with a translation of the Armenian so that we can look at this. If you're familiar with this psalm at all, you'll notice immediately there are some differences from um, any of the English versions that would be familiar to us. I think it's also interesting to note that in the Armenian, the ascriptions, the headings of the Psalms are often, as is the case here, the first verse of the Psalm. So I won't read the Armenian since we had a chance to hear it, but I'll read the Armen the English of it. A Psalm of David at the time when he fled from the presence of his son Absalom. Lord, for those who corner me are many. Many have risen up upon me. Many have said of me, there is no salvation for him with his God. But you, O Lord, are my helper, my glory, the lifter up of my head. I called out to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy mountain. I slumbered and was asleep. I awoke. Oh, and I left this a little unfinished here. I awoke. And this was a little tricky for me. So we have entuneli im e. So you could translate this possibly as um, the Lord is my acceptable one. Um, the one who accepts me, uh, which is very different than we'll see how um, the Hebrew and what is rendered in English. Usually it's something like the Lord is my sustainer or the Lord sustains me. So very different uh, meaning there. I did not fear their tens of thousands of hosts. They who circling, circling me have kept me walled in. Come, Lord, and save me, my God, for you have struck all those who in vain were against me as enemies, and you have crushed the teeth of sinners. Salvation is the Lord's. Your blessing is upon your people. So a couple little things I'd like to point out uh, linguistically or vocabularily. In verse 2, what I've translated as those who corner me, we have this word nerichk. These are people that squeeze us, nerel, if you've heard of being nervads, it's the same root in modern. Um, so these are people that corner us in, that squeeze us, that um, put a lot of pressure on us. And so it's easy to see why David was using these words. His, his son Absalom had cornered him and had put him in um, difficult spots. And many are those who've risen up against me. Harian, of course, we have the this verb, you can't hear it without thinking of harel, harutun. Um, so the different ways that rising, you know, here we have it used in a very negative connotation. Um, but of course, we know that the flip side is what Vartan alluded to in his ascription, the victory that comes in the resurrection. In the Armenian, also in verse 7, we have I purot zorats no I did not fear their ten, tens of thousands of hosts. And in the Armenian, it's very clear. These are, these are warriors. It's not people. And often in the English, that gets rendered as, as people. But this is very much um, someone who's being pursued by, by armies. Again, tens of thousands of, of these soldiers. Um, and yet... The speaker, David, or us, um, has not feared them. And these are people who've encircled David, who've encircled us, and yet we do not fear. And we have this um, exclamation in verse 8, And you'll hear this echoed in um, 
different places in scripture, different places in in the services. Come, Lord, and save me. Kurgyazis, deliver me, save me. And while it was the Hazunk who Hariyan, here you have its Asvads who Harels. So the the multitudes rose up, but God struck all of those who were um, against us in vain or against David in vain. And I I haven't delved into this piece about Zadamunas Megavorats Peshrest Ses, whether there's some interesting commentary on, on this phrase here that you have crushed the teeth of sinners. Um, what the context for that is, I'm not sure. So moving on, we have in this next slide, I've got on the left, I have the translation of the Armenian. And here on the right, I have the uh, RSV translation. So this would be from the, again, from the Hebrew Masoretic text. And so you can see it's mostly the same, but there are differences um, in uh, notably that the numbering is different. And in verse two in the Armenian, you have many have risen upon me. So it's past tense in the Hebrew. Here we have it's, it's current, it's present tense. They are rising against me. And again, Verse three in the Armenian, many have said of me. We have again in, in the Hebrew, it's, it's present tense. Many are saying for me. And then verse three in the Hebrew is very different. You are a shield about me. We do not have that in the Armenian at all. Um, we have helper, oknagan. And verse 4 in the Hebrew, I cry aloud. It's a little bit more emphatic than what we have in the Armenian. Gartatsi is more like calling out. It's not, we have different words we would use for crying out. And whether it's a holy hill or a holy mountain, uh, you know, in the Armenian, it's very clear it's a mountain. It's a little bit more um, dramatic, I think, you, if you hear God hearing you from a holy mountain versus his holy hill. And what I mentioned in verse 6 or verse 5 here in the Hebrew, the Lord sustains me. Um, we have that the Lord accepts me. Um, and then in verse 8, we have, for thou dost smite all my enemies on the cheek, which we do not have in the Armenian. We have that you've struck all those who in vain were against me as enemies. Um, and breaking teeth versus crushing, it's a, again a little bit more graphic in the Armenian or a little bit more uh, specific in, in what's actually happening there. So I wanted to spend just a little bit of time looking at another one of our friends. This is Grigor Datevatsi. And in his commentary on this psalm, at the very beginning, he says that there are four things that are necessary for understanding any psalm. And so he lays these out, and it's a nice little exegetical tool that uh, he obviously uh, thought was very important. And It'll be interesting to see if he uses it um, all the time. But he says these are the four things that are necessary. First is the order of the psalm. So where does a psalm, and this goes back to if you've been uh, present for any of the exegesis classes, this connects with one of our C's, which one of our keys, which is context. So what is the, not just the order, but the, how is it arranged in the book of Psalms? What comes before, what comes after? So this is the third Psalm. We've got two before it. Um, and the, the subject matter of those Psalms, which 
Um, here we have, it's the third Psalm, so he connects it to the Trinity. And um, whereas earlier Psalms were connected to Christ's death, uh, and Vartan connects this one to his death and resurrection, Gregory connects it mainly to his resurrection. And then he says the number is important. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what he does with numbers like, I don't know, 27 or 43. But with three, it was pretty straightforward. So um, he immediately links it to the Trinity, um, which was nice and easy for him. Uh, and then he goes into the, the explanation. So what is the explanation of the psalm? You have to look at that. And then the scope. So what does the tidumen, the explanation is the badjar. Um, so what does this psalm refer to? And so he has an elaborate discussion on um, what these nerichk are. So what are they in human life? Um, and uh, how when they are most active in human life. So he connects them with, um, with devils that are particularly active at several points in the human life. So, and some of these are the first being baptism. So right when a uh, catechumen is baptized is one of the main times that the um, demons work really hard against an individual. So they, they're the nerich at that moment. And then in the moment of confession, you know, when a person um, decides to confess sins, when a person has a good thought, uh, the, the demons are particularly uh, active. Um, when a person is um, at their last breath, so it's sort of the beginning of life at baptism, the end of earthly life, this is when the demons are most active. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth mentioning that you can look at demons, whether you think of them as these um, created entities or whether you look at them as um, any of the different challenges that arise in human life. Um, and, you know, the, all of the feelings and emotions that arise at these different moments that I mentioned, how those might be. Um, you know, we talk about our, our uh, an in, a person's devils, not as necessarily um, these little red or big red beings floating around. Um, but you know, what are what are a person's demons that they have to work through? And I think the analogy um, works well here. So I'm going to leave you um, with that. This was just a little bit of a taste of Psalm 3. And um, if you have an opportunity to chant this psalm, whether in Armenian or English, at the beginning of your day, um, I hope that, it's, that you have a, a little bit bigger uh, awareness of, of how this psalm has served um, many over the centuries to begin their day in the dark of the night. Um, as soon as they open their lips, these are the words that come forward. Okay, so we'll take a five minute break. Uh, my watch says 819. So if we come back at 824 ish, eight, why don't we make it an even 825? Um, and we'll continue from there. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Since Deacon Yervant just gave us a little glimpse into the commentator's remarks on Psalm 3, pointing out the odd contrast that there is between our expectations, perhaps, when someone says, Lord, if you open my lips, my mouth will sing your praise. And then the sudden transition into there are so many things pushing me into a corner. And his thoughts based on Gregory of Datev, Krikor Datevati, that would take that idea of the many things that push me into a corner and apply it 
primarily to the spiritual life of monks, but also of us as the thoughts and the temptations and the testing and all of that that comes to us in life. So I'd like to jump to the other end of the sequence, to Psalm 142. And here's what it says. Lord, hear my prayer. In your truth, heed my requests. Hear me with your justice. Do not enter into judgment with your service, servant, for in your presence no fleshly being is righteous. My enemy has pursued my soul. He has bent my life to the ground and has sat me down in darkness like one dead to the ages. My soul in me had had enough and my heart riled me up. I remembered the old days. I pondered all your works. I meditated on the creations of your hands. I lifted my hands to you. My soul like soil thirsts towards you. Hear me quickly, Lord, because my soul is fainting away from me. Do not turn your presence from me. I will be like those who go down into a pit. In the morning, make your generosity audible to me, for I have trusted in you, O God. Show me the path where I shall walk, because I have lifted up my soul to you, Lord. Save me from my enemies, Lord, for I have made you my refuge. Teach me to do your will, because you are my God. Your good spirit will lead me to an honest land. You will give me life, Lord, for your name's sake. Through your righteousness, you will take my soul out of its straits. You will kill all my enemies with your generosity because I am your servant. You will destroy all those who are closing my soul in. It's interesting that this is Psalm 142. Because after all, in the Vesper service, the central sequence of Psalms is Psalm 139, Psalm 140, Psalm 141, and here's Psalm 142 at the end of the beginning of the night service. Or maybe to look at it the other way around, <laughs> by using Psalm 142 at the end of this opening sequence of Psalms in the night service, Psalm 139, 140, and 141 are also implicitly present because those psalms would still be fresh in the mind of a person who had just said them a few hours before. That's especially true for Psalm 141, which, as we shall see, was written according to its heading at a time when David was hiding in a dark cave, trying to escape the attention of King Saul who was hunting him down. And then suddenly in this great plot twist, Saul of whom David was fearful, rightly so, came in, into the cave unwittingly putting himself at David's mercy in the darkness. And David faced a different challenge, the challenge of his own soul. There are other reasons why Psalm 142 is interesting here and why it makes sense that it would be the last one in the four fixed Psalms in the night service. Because like Psalm 3, which we just heard about, Psalm 142 also has an unexpected plot twist. It's not in the psalm, but it's there in the story, the story that Yervant told us at the beginning of his presentation. Just like Psalm 3, Psalm 142's heading says, this is a psalm of David in a time when his son Absalom was pursuing him. The heading's interesting. It's not there in the Hebrew. It's partly there in the Greek, in the Septuagint, but it's only the Armenian that specifically mentions Absalom by name. 
In the Greek, it only says when he was being pursued by his son. It leaves the Absalom off. So the Armenian has added Absalom's name just to make that connection even clearer. Psalm 3 and Psalm 142 are connected by that story that forms a bridge between them. And in this psalm, as you can see, David affirms, you will slay my enemies in your generosity, in your mercy, you will slay my enemies, is another way of translating it. You will destroy those who are closing in on my soul. And as we heard, Absalom was indeed killed when his own hair caught him. A plot twist that David did not welcome, but for which he had actually, probably unknowingly, prayed. So, as we've seen before, Khosrovan Tevatsi would remind us that it's not all about David. And so, although the Absalom story does link the first and the last Psalms in the sequence together, there is more to be had here. Khosrov says, just as there are many members of the body and only one mouth speaks on behalf of them all, so also there are many members of the human race. And through the prophet David, who is the mouth of Adam's race, all of them offer petitions to God. And because the prophet David was seeing everything by the Spirit's revelation, he saw in one and the same place that his prayers were effective on his own behalf, and so he spoke as if it were about himself. However, the words that he relates are not just for himself. So, who else are they for? Vartan points out some interesting, unusual phrasing in Psalm 142. Lord, hear my prayer. In your truth, heed my requests. Hear me with your justice. And Vartan says, isn't it odd that David often asks God to hear his prayer with compassion or to hear his prayer with generosity or to hear his prayer Marta Sirutiamp with his affection for the human race. Here, he says instead, hear my prayers with your justice. Because after all, there was a basic injustice being done in the, the story of David and Absalom. And so Vartan says, although the title, a Psalm of David when he was being pursued by his son Absalom, although that title was not put there by the ancients, nonetheless, it suits the intent of the Psalm. For although David had sinned, more than once, some of them quite spectacularly. Yet Absalom's wickedness in persecuting and pursuing his own father was greater. And so effectively, David is asking God to hear his prayer, not because David is perfect, but because what Absalom is doing outweighs anything that David had done. And so he says, don't hear me with your love of humanity, hear me with your justice. I am not a perfect person and yet redress for what I am presently suffering is just and appropriate. And then having made his complaint, 
his plea for justice, even if it's relative justice. David then, according to Vartan, takes a step back and gets some perspective on the situation. I remembered the old days. I pondered all your works. I meditated on the creations of your hands. Then I lifted my hands to you. My soul, like soil, thirsts towards you. So what was David doing? According to Vartan, David was actually saying, I remembered Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, whom you heard and saved. I pondered all your works not just in saving them, but in creating all of the creatures. And I recalled that you are able in all ways. And I meditated on the fact that you created us with your own hands as a demonstration of your inexpressible love for us. And once I had seen those things clearly, according to Vartan, that's the point at which David says, trusting in that, I said, my soul, like the soil from which I was made, thirsts towards you who are its prototype. I resemble our forefather Adam in hell from where he and we cannot emerge without help. In other words, Vartan says, the whole situation in which David finds himself clarified once he began looking a little bit farther. David is not the only person who has ever appealed to God for help. And the reasons why one would expect help from God are, first of all, his love. Second of all, our resemblance to him, our family resemblance. And then the realization that, yes, I cannot get myself out of this situation, but you can. And so if we were to apply Vartan's interpretation to our own situations, which is one of the layers of interpretation that Vartan would expect us to do, perhaps it might benefit us as well, not only to identify with the third psalm in which David lists the innumerability of the things that are harassing him. But perhaps we too would benefit by panning back, as Vartan says David did, shifting our perspective to something wider, focusing less on our problem of the moment, focusing less on the injustices of the moment, and focusing more on the creator for whom we all thirst like the soil we are, our heart longing for our own individual return to the divine image and for the collective return of humanity to God's likeness as well. Part of the greater perspective that David got, according to Vartan, by zooming out to look at all of human history and even to the creation of humans is a kind of self-knowledge.
That self-knowledge is one of the things that Krikor Datavatsi chose to highlight in his pretty short comments on Psalm 142. Datavatsi chooses to hone in for all of his commentary, or almost all of it, on the implicit link between Psalm 141 from the Vesper service and Psalm 142 in the night service. He says, when you look at them together, the two of them show us two different Davids, David before night and David during night would be one way perhaps to put it. And Atavatsi says the words of those two Psalms, when you take them side by side, even though they're not in the same service, they show that difference. They show the difference between who David was when hiding in that cave. He was a young man. He was not yet king. Hiding there to, per, to escape Saul's pursuit. All of his life and activity still lay before him. He couldn't quite see the way to it yet. But the aftermath of that psalm would show him the path. Psalm 142 shows us who David was in his old age. When he was being pursued by his son Absalom, Absalom was already a mature man. And David faced that pursuit, having been king for years, and having used and abused the prerogatives of kingship, having obeyed and disobeyed the commandments of God and God's direct orders, having lost his son Ammon to the hand of his son Absalom, having been unable to protect his daughter Tamar, whose life was forever changed twice first by Ammon and then by his death. Those are dark experiences. And the difference, Krikor says, between who we were when we were yet innocent and full of confidence in our own rightness and who we are later in life may be very different. Gregory says, Psalm 141 was written prior to David's sin with Bathsheba, but not only with Bathsheba. Whereas Psalm 142 was written after. This is why he is now wise enough to say, do not enter into judgment with your servant. This change has to do with the consequences that follow from our actions. It shows that every consequence we experience is truly a judgment of God, and it is right. So who we were when we can remind God that God ought to act on our behalf because we have been true and righteous even when others have fallen short or have fallen, period. And who we are when life has beaten us at our own game. It's a very large difference. When wrong has found its way into our impregnable righteousness, and when we have gained a more realistic, a more humbling perspective on how our fragile human justice and righteousness and goodness, 
fail to hold up in the face of trials and temptations. When we have a basis for comparing our own justice and goodness with the eternal, indescribable righteousness, justice, and goodness of God. Qualities that cannot be shaken, that cannot be infiltrated by any temptation or testing, no matter how subtle it is or how insidious. It was not lost on David that Absalom was seeking his death unjustly. Rather, as David himself had sought the death of Bathsheba's husband unjustly for his own convenience. And how, as the prophet Nathan said, how David had taken that man's one lamb when he had many others in his own legitimate flock. He thought of how he had raised his own children and what kind of an example he had set for them and he became between Psalm 141 in the cave and Psalm 142 being pursued by Absalom, David became a different man. And Datavatsi gives several examples of how the wording changed from one Psalm to the other. In Psalm 141, David could boldly say, I shall spread out my prayer before the Lord. I have humbled myself greatly. Well and good, and so he had. But now, in Psalm 142, he says instead, the enemy has pursued my soul, he has humbled me. He has brought me low. In Psalm 141, David could say, when my soul was fading, you knew my path. In Psalm 142, it says, my soul has faded away from me. In Psalm 141, in the cave, he could say, you are my hope. In Psalm 142, running from Absalom, he would say, not only have I made you my hope, but you are my refuge. I do not have the strength. In Psalm 141, he said, lead me to the land of the living. <laughs> the place where my worth would place me. In Psalm 142, lead me to an honest land. Lead me to the land of the upright, the place where such things do not happen, either those that I have done or those that are now being done to me. What a difference a night makes. Just the difference between vespers and the night prayers. What a difference an experience of darkness makes in life, whether it's physical darkness, spiritual. What a difference from the youthful confidence to the awareness of age the wisdom and self-understanding that has passed through the night of temptation. Temptation to take the powers that have been given to one for good and to use them instead for one's own gratification. A night that David had experienced 
and even relished. And yet both Psalms, both then and now, both before and during, and as we'll see next time also after the darkness, after the night, God remains the same towards us then David would say the righteous wait for me until you reward me in the confidence that God is the one who rewards and now in Psalm 142 a deeper realization. Teach me to do your will. Why? Because you're my God. Your good spirit will lead me to an honest land. Then and now, the same God with a different person approaching him. The gifts of night <laughs> include not only the stars, but the opportunity to reevaluate oneself in the light of who God is and who one has become. <laughs>